Welcome everyone to Hot Science at Home. We're so glad you could make it. The Environmental Science Institute at the University of Texas at Austin is proud to bring you the latest and coolest advancements in science through Hot Science at Home. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Professor Dr. Marie Baja of the University of Texas, our special guest for this evening. Welcome, Dr. Ja. How are you tonight? Aloha and slow down. That's what people on Molokai have to say as soon as you uh, get out of that airport. <laughs> and would you like to give a shout out to your crew in Molokai? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate being here. I would like to give a shout out to uh, all the students at Molokai Middle School, uh, all the students at Akaula School, the teachers, Vicky, you know, Dara, uh, Senator Linda Coit, Barbara, you know, all the people at Maui Economic and Development Board that helped make this uh, moment happen. And I just want to say to each one of the students, uh, I love you. I'm, I'm, I'm here because of you. So hopefully I'm doing you justice and carrying your torch. All right. Welcome, you all. And for the rest of our audience, let me give you a brief background about Dr. Ja. He's an astrodynamicist. In more plain language, he's a rocket scientist. Before UT, he worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab as a navigation engineer for several Mars missions. That's the same title as a 23rd century human Starfleet officer named Sulu. For his research, Dr. Ja has received international recognition. He's been asked to testify to Congress and to be part of the UN's Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which sounds like really important committee work. Dr. Ja took an interesting route to becoming a scientist. Born in San Francisco, he was raised in Venezuela and graduating from a military high school. He moved to the US and enlisted in the Air Force and served in the military police. Before then, changing, pivoting, and studying aerospace engineering in college. So Mariba, let's get into it. As an environmental scientist myself, when I learned about your work, I was somewhat surprised. You're linking the traditional environmental science of land, air, and ocean with space. What is space environmentalism all about? Thank you uh, so much, Jay, uh, for asking me. Look, sometime after this glorious time of me uh, navigating satellites and rovers to Mars, I relocated with my family to Maui and on Maui, working with the Air Force Research Laboratory, I saw a couple of things. One, living on Maui, I saw lots of single use plastics being generated by the tourist industry. I saw a landfill on the island that exists today and trees on the outskirts of that landfill are decorated with trash bags and these sorts of things and the stench is horrible. That experience broke me and it's like that to this day. Um, and I saw a culture of indigenous people, native Hawaiians, whose knowledge about being in harmony with their environment, whose view of stewardship and custodianship was displaced by a more kind of Western culture of ownership of stuff. And this was juxtaposed with me looking at telescope data on things orbiting the Earth where we were tracking about 23, 25,000 things the size of a cell phone all the way to the space station. And of that number, 96% was garbage. And I'm like, oh, wow. What we're doing to the land, uh, we've done to the oceans with plastics. We've polluted all sorts of ecosystems on the planet. Here's this kind of long lost, unacknowledged ecosystem of sorts in space. And we're doing the same thing to that. And so that's what really helped me kind of connect these things. And uh, I've Well, Mar Mariba, you're frozen, if you could hear us. I'm back. I'm back. You're back from outer space. 
All okay, right. so, so where, did, where did you lose me? Um, well, you you were talking about it, it's sort of an epiphany you had, right? Yeah. Where you learned. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You were talking about the how how space environmentalism is kind of an ecosystem, even though there are no living things there. Do you want to elaborate on how orbital space around the Earth, how you see that as an ecosystem? Absolutely. So when I looked at the definition of ecosystems and kind of what comprise these things on Earth, mainly biological systems. And so, so we'll, I'll say this. There are biological forms in near-Earth outer space, and we secretly call these people astronauts. So, so, so they, they're, they're, they're there. Um, but aside from them, really, we don't have that, right? It's a bunch of robotic stuff. But I looked at how ecosystems are defined in terms of energy cycles. You have you know, predator, prey, decomposers, these sorts of things. And I started asking myself, well, we have a whole set of things that we can't track, small things that are colliding with the larger stuff. We could view that as a form of predation. Um, we could say that when things die, they start breaking up on their own. There's a decomposing process. Uh, some things generate their own energy in ecosystems. We could say that satellites do that with solar panels, absorbing light. And they're not doing photosynthesis, but they're doing their own kind of synthesis of solar energy to uh, operate their own internal systems. Mm -hmm. So there are interesting analogies between these robotic systems in near-Earth space and traditional ecosystems, uh, you know, land and oceans. Very, very interesting analogy. Would, would you like to share us some of the data you work with that shows us the extent of the issue? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do that. And so let me see. Trying this, of course, technology always works. So let's try this. Uh, right. I'm going to try to share a window. Here we go. And... Voila, we're going to do this. Hopefully people can see that. Can you see that, Jay? Cannot. There we go. Now we okay. can. Okay. Excellent. So, yeah, basically I was, I was warned that there was a little bit of lag, you know, photons and, and, and electrons going through the system. So here we go. We have all of these. So this is called astrograph. It is a kind of a crowdsourced database that we've created here at the University of Texas at Austin, where we aggregate opinions <clears throat> about stuff in space. And every single dot, it's not to scale. Uh, so th the dots don't reflect the actual size. If they did, we wouldn't really see anything. It just <clears throat> really reflects the location with respect to the Earth. All the orange stuff, those are things that are working. And everything else is garbage. And I see a little cluster of dots here. Let me click on one. I'm going to guess. There we go. Starlink, SpaceX's uh, satellites for global internet. So you can kind of see how close they are to the earth. You can click on any one of these things and get some information about this stuff. But yeah, we have, we have orbital highways in space. Uh, these highways are becoming more congested. One of the ones that just pops out readily is this ring, outer ring, uh, that we call the geostationary or geosynchronous region where, where you put something in orbit there, it takes about 24 hours for it to go around once, which is a solar day. So yeah, we have these, these highways. And uh, as you can see, it's, it, it's, it's not empty. You know, space is not a complete vacuum. We've done a good job of uh, populating this stuff. So there you go. Wow, that is really cool and really scary too. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, I find the concept of the tragedy of the commons to be a useful analogy for teaching about sustainability on Earth. It, it seems that space represents the hugest of all commons. Yeah, I, I, I love that analogy. And some people don't like it so much, but here's, here's the deal, right? Um, all of outer space might be infinite, but that region that you saw around the globe with all these dots, it's finite. And Outer Space Treaty pretty much encourages everybody to 
freely use uh, outer space. It says unhindered access and use for peaceful purposes. But you can imagine that with these highways, we have more than 90 countries that call, them, you know, call themselves spacefaring in one way or another are utilizing space or have a satellite and these sorts of things. You can imagine that if everybody just starts launching things and behaving in whatever way they feel is adequate for themselves without coordination, without planning, without notifying other people of when they might move to where, I think it's not too hard to see that eventually that doesn't scale and bad things are going to happen uh, because we're not jointly managing this stuff. And when things start bumping into each other and we can't really predict when these things are going to happen, the carrying capacity of these orbits become saturated and you can't use them anymore. And so I would say that the carrying capacity, we can think of this carrying capacity on these orbital highways as being saturated when our decisions and actions can no longer prevent undesirable things from happening, right? If we want to prevent collisions and we try to do everything we can to prevent them and they're still happening, then by all intents and purposes, that space, uh, pun intended, is unusable. And so we, on our current path, we are guaranteed to reach that tragedy of the commons unless we do something differently. Oh, very, very apt analogy. You know, when I was growing up, it seems that this all got started, and unbeknownst to us at the time, it all got started by the race to space between the U.S. and the Russians. Now, there's a lot of new competition in the race with many private companies launching satellites. Is this a good thing? Does this change the nature of the challenge you're describing for us? So, so one of the things that I'd love to say is that um, all the satellites being launched aren't necessarily uh, the culprits of problems. To some extent, they're victims uh, of this tragedy of the commons that, that, that we're facing. And I would say that every time that we've explored a given domain, whether it's the oceans, land, air, the first thing that happens is that those that are well-financed, those that are well-resourced, precede the rest of humanity from being able to enjoy these things on a you know be, you know daily basis that sort of stuff and so i've seen a lot of things in the press about oh you know elon this jeff bezos that and so on and so forth and uh this isn't so good and billionaires taking joy rides that's actually a positive sign if we see people spending their own resources to engage in activities in this environment that's not necessarily accessible to the rest of us, that's actually a good sign that eventually you and I are going to be able to go to space and it's going to be like commonplace. Oh, we're going to wake up and just, you know, get on a rocket and like, you know, go somewhere between here and the moon or, or someplace else. That's where we need to get to. Okay. But I guess my word of caution is the manner in which we do this, because at the same time, history has shown us that every time that we've done this sort of exploration, it has been to the detriment of the environment. Oh, you know, there's gold to be mined. We're just going to put a bunch of towns. Who cares about the silt? Who cares about mercury deposits, blah, blah, blah. So we need to encourage those that are well-financed to continue to try to explore space and utilize it in many ways to our benefit. Internet, climate change monitoring, looking at if people are following treaties or not, right? Uh, following refugees. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff going around the globe that space-based information actually keeps people honest. These are all positive things. But the way in which we do stuff needs to be with inclusive dialogues and with a foundation of ecological sustainability. Right on. I, I, I really resonate with you reconstructing the history of exploration and exploitation of the earth with the same thing with space is an important difference here is that we're sort of just getting going time-wise in the exploration of space compared to the long history of exploration of the earth and is that a good thing because we have time now to get out in front of this in these early stages and do something about it i think that ultimately the uh responsibility 
of how this plays out falls squarely on governments. I mean, international law, the Outer Space Treaty says that states party to the treaty are responsible for providing authorization and continuing supervision of all activities of non-government actors. We have a UN Convention of Liability and Damage that pretty much puts that responsibility on governments. So if governments are going to authorize people to launch and do stuff in space, I think governments just need to get together and say, hey, you know, we're, we're the ones responsible. Let's agree to a common set of practices and protocols. And let's make sure that this environment doesn't get to this tragedy of the commons. Let's make sure that this environment is something that for many generations we can continue to enjoy and uh, benefit from. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. So to dig down a little deeper into it, did, did you have some real-time data that you'd like to share with us about yeah. what's going on up there right now? Absolutely. So one of the things that I love is uh, I think, you know, picture's worth uh, a thousand words sort of thing. So I'm actually going to show that. And so people are like, okay, really how busy it is? Space is big. Who cares? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's look at that. Let's look at the how big space is, right? So I talked about these highways. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. So this is what we call our conjunction streaming service. Conjunction is when we predict that any two objects are going to come close to each other. So then the question is, well, what's close? Well, let me tell you. So let's call close uh, anything coming within six miles or 10 kilometers of each other. So what you're seeing is this. It's not all the stuff we track, but we're making comparisons of almost 20,000 objects uh, in, in near real time. And we're saying over the next 20 minutes, continuously, over the next 20 minutes, which pair of these 20,000 can we predict will come within six miles or 10 kilometers of each other? And for those that satisfy that criterion, show me. And this is what you see. So the green dots are a pair of objects where both are working. You see a couple of green dots here at zero. Uh, the reason why you see these things at zero is because this is something that's attached to the space station. So it, it makes sense that zero distance from each other. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the yellow dots are things where one of these things is working and the other one is dead, piece of garbage. And the red dots are when both objects are dead. And so you can see, even though uh, you see a lot of crisscrossings, I'm not saying that all these things lead to collisions. Of course not. But it says, look, there are highways in space. The highways, as opposed to highways here on the planet, right? I mean, Interstate 35 doesn't just intersect with another interstate where the traffic goes through each other. <laughs> in space, we don't have, we don't, we, yeah. So, so we don't have orbital highways where one goes above and one goes below purposefully these things can actually cross each other. That's the issue. And there are no stoplights. These okay. Are, yeah. All ahead. right. So the next 20 minutes is represented by the x-axis, right? Absolutely. So you and can the y-axis is distance between the objects. That's right. So the okay. y-axis here is distance between the objects. Here I, I have my cursor that you can barely see. This is now. So anything that comes right here is what we predict is happening right now. And so this is a now cast. And as I move my cursor this way, I'm forecasting, you know, 10 minutes, 15, all the way to 20 minutes ahead. So this is a, tw this is if my eyesight went 20 minutes into the future, this is what I'm seeing. Wow. So a few weeks ago, would we've been able to see a little spot here representing the position of William Shatner as he huh. went up into space for five minutes. So, 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 the, so the answer is you should have been able to see something like that. And the interesting thing to note here is the relative speed of the crisscrossings, right? So here you have things in kilometers per second. Let me just put this in a perspective for people. One kilometer per second is like the speed of a bullet. And this, this is representing objects larger than you like a cell phone. So, so several times this, the size of a bullet. So imagine if a bullet, which goes at the speed of a bullet, uh, can do a lot of damage. Imagine a bullet traveling 15 times the speed of a bullet at like 10 to 100 times its size hitting a satellite, oh. yowza. 
So that's what we're talking about. Man. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for in real time showing us the extent of the problem. That's just really brings it home. Um, so to to transition over to uh, some of the questions that I know our audience is uh, is dying to to ask you, what would be your call to action for people who ask what 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 can be done? Look, the easiest thing. So several things. Um, I would say this. I'm I'm really interested in getting more and more information about stuff in space. If you're somebody that has a telescope, you're an amateur astronomer, you have a telescope, you're a ham radio operator. If you have any sort of measurements of stuff in space, I want those. I want to say yes. So 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 imagine like a Waze for space, right? That Waze app, I have one of those things. I use it uh, all the time. We want to develop this sort of thing. In fact, um, you know, I'm the chief scientific advisor for this company, Privateer, and that's what we want to create is kind of this ways for space. Can we just bring in everybody's information as a participatory sensing network? And it's like you, the user, could see in near real time when somebody adds information and, oh, wow, there's a piece of debris here. Or maybe you want, might want to avoid this highway, go to this other one because there's too much traffic or something is uh, in the middle of the road. So we'd like to create that, but clearly not everybody has these sorts of resources. So to people that don't have that, the best thing that you could do is this, right? We have elected officials. Governments are ultimately responsible for this sort of stuff. I want, I hope that somehow I can recruit your empathy about this problem and have you see how we use space, treat it in a way as if your life depended on it. That's it. That's what I want to see happen is for people to treat the environment as if their lives depended on it and then hold the people that they elect in the office accountable for actually doing something with a positive bias towards a desirable, you know, desirable outcome. That's what I'd love for people to be able to do. Wow. Thanks for bringing it home with such a clear message. Appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mariva, for sharing all of this with us. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Are you, are you ready for some questions from, from our audience? Let's do it. Okay. Let, let us go to the questions. There are a lot of good ones, but there's also room for you guys to continue to ask them. So let's start with uh, Ricky J.R. Arocha, who asks, do we know who the main polluters are? Yes. Is it possible? That, for, okay. Yeah, that go one, ahead. That one's easy. U.S., China, Russia. And, and his two-part question is followed up with, is it possible for humans to be quote unquote trapped on earth if space pollution continues? I don't, I don't see that as being realistic in the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, I don't see this Wally kind of thing, right? I think <laughs> I'm hoping that we can do a lot better than Wally. Uh, so I don't think it'll get that bad, but um, you know, we, we tend to get into action. Unfortunately, when we see cataclysmic things happening, uh, so I'm trying to motivate us not waiting for that to happen. But no, I don't think we're going to be trapped by our own debris. All right. Uh, Matt Brafford asks, who regulates the orbital zones and how are they regulated? Is there any sort of international regulation that exists? So what exists are conventions and treaties. That's international law, like the Outer Space Treaty, Convention on Registration of Objects, Liability and Damage. But these are very open to interpretation and implementation. So there's so even though these treaties are out there, there's no space cop, there's no space vice, um, there's no space patroller, you know? So uh, if somebody were to do something that clearly violated that, well, let me give you an example, right? I don't know. Uh, in 2007, China, they blew up one of their satellites in a sufficiently high orbit where those debris are still causing problems to other objects. No, no, nobody is suffering any consequences uh, as a result of that anti-satellite test. India blew up one of their own satellites recently in a lower, much lower orbit, but those pieces, some of those didn't re-enter anytime soon. Uh, 
right? Several countries have done that. The U.S. has blown up one of its own satellites, uh, you know, in, in very low Earth orbit. So I think for sure one of the things that we need to say is stop blowing up your stuff in orbit. <laughs> uh, but but yes, nobody's going to jail over these things. Hmm. The next question comes from uh, Meg, and she asks, how do you think space environmentalism should be taught in school systems? Is it a topic meant for higher level classes or a topic that should be taught from a young age? And uh, I think there are some listeners in the, in, out in the Pacific Ocean who have a real strong feeling about this, but I'll let you answer for them. I'll, I'll say this, uh, you know, honoring uh, my, my brothers and sisters in the Hawaiian islands on Molokai and the middle Molokai middle school in Akaula and such, I'll say this. I don't think it's ever too early to learn about this stuff. In fact, I've been thinking about writing a children's book about space environmentalism, which I think would be very well received. And I don't know, I have older kids, you know, teenagers, one in college, but I also have a four-year-old. She totally gets these concepts. Uh, I think we need to recognize that children are pretty smart. They understand these things and, and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't believe that they're incapable of, of getting this sort of stuff. So I think, yeah, as, as early as possible, if you can have, as if you can have a book that you read to your child, you can talk about space environmentalism. So I think that young. Right from the beginning. Raymond asks, how difficult is it to monitor space junk and which countries that they're coming from? How can you, how easy it is to tag these things? It's very difficult to tag these things, actually, because nobody has persistent, ubiquitous, I'm monitoring everything all the time in space capability. Nobody has that. The U.S. has a very good uh, sensor network, but that's owned and operated by the, the Department of Defense, so it doesn't necessarily share all that stuff with everybody. Russia has a pretty good network. The European Union is putting together their own space surveillance and tracking kind of capability, other countries individually, Poland and so on and so forth, they have their own telescope. So everybody has their own set of eyes. Here's what we don't have, a combined set of eyes. Uh, we, don't, we, we, we don't bring all of our eyes together to monitor, verify, assess, hold people accountable. So that's one of the things that my work at UT Austin and with Privateer we're trying to do is create a more ubiquitous eyes on the sky and identifying and attributing behaviors to specific actors and making that very transparent. Great, thanks. These are great questions, you guys. Here's, here's another good one. Emilio asks, could space environmentalism eventually impact the Earth's climate? What is a way that we could help, if so? Yeah, so I think that's great. Look, Emilio, uh, most people don't even think about that sort of stuff. Here's an example, right? Uh, people are putting satellites into low Earth orbit because with atmospheric friction, these things eventually, when they're uncontrolled, will re-enter and burn up in the atmosphere. And so people are saying, ah, Mother Nature will take care of it. Mother Nature will burn this stuff up. But the particulates of the materials that are burning up, what is the long-term effect to the ozone and all these other things, right? So that's part of climate change. So this is a great question that some people are thinking about, but not enough people are thinking about. So I, I really love, Emilio, the fact that you asked this question because it's very relevant. Right on. Uh, so Sophia wants to know, has there been any international laws, conventions, or even suggestions that have already taken place in align with sustainability and space exploration? Sophia, great question. Here's what I'm going to say. Um, I've participated personally at the United Nations in this Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPOS. And just a few years ago, I think 93 countries, by consensus, all signed, all agreed to 21 guidelines called long-term sustainability guidelines. So they all said yes. But now the question is, all right, now what? Are these countries actually implementing these things? That's So that's, that's the relevant question is, now that these guidelines exist, how are people actually implementing them so that they, they can actually be meaningful? And uh, I don't know yet. Very interesting. Um, and so following up on that, Nicholas has a question that's uh, closely related. 
Have you had the opportunity to present this data to whichever organizations are sending these objects into space? And if you have, could you elaborate on what their response was? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Nicholas, uh, great question. I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm fairly plugged into a lot of different parts of humanity when it comes to this. I've presented this to the Senate Commerce uh, Committee twice, Senator Ted Cruz and other folks there. Um, I actually have chaired some activities within NATO, their science and technology organization related to this. And in fact, I chaired one where, where we did the first study of space domain awareness and what NATO needs to know about things of this nature in space. Uh, having worked for the Air Force Research Lab for a decade, I've presented this to the Pentagon, NASA, countries like Switzerland, Scotland have invited me, specifically Japan, to advise them on these things and present this to them. So the answer is yes. I've been gallivanting all over the world, evangelizing uh, uh, humanity with respect to space environmentalism. And everybody says, wow, this is a real problem. We should do something about it. So everybody feels that way, but uh, you know, I say acta non verba, right? Uh, actions, not words. That's what we need. Right on. Madison asks, if if you're knowledgeable about this, what is one thing that is happening at NASA right now that the public may not know about? And before you answer, let me just say, our audience has not signed non-disclosure agreements. Just... <laughs> I'll put it this way. Um, NASA... Something that happening at NASA right now that public may not know about is NASA is trying to get uh, a better answer as to what it does in terms of orbital debris research. Uh, the White House has actually organized an interagency group looking at how to address uh, orbital debris and what should be the priorities in terms of a national orbital debris research and development program. So NASA is front and center on that. People at uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Lori Kraft Newman, she leads something called the Conjunction Analysis Risk Assessment Group, NASA CARA, and her daughter is CARA. I wonder if there's any uh, relationship there. Anyway, they're looking at how to really quantify collision risk and bring tools to the table that can be meaningful for avoiding collisions. So NASA is doing a lot of uh, work. Uh, the European Space Agency and other entities around the globe are also doing a lot of work. So it's not just NASA. Many other space agencies are worried about this, UAE, a bunch of others, right? So there's a lot of folks actually doing work. It's just not, um, things just aren't fast enough in terms of how this winds up into regulation into monitoring and enforcement. These are the things that uh, take a lot more time. Okay. Uh, Shana asks, Dr. Zha, please talk a bit about your new role at Privateer. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Shana. So I think the, the easiest way to say this is, is in this fashion. You've known me right now through these few minutes as a space environmentalist and the things that I'm passionate about, this idea of recognizing that all things are interconnected, uh, honoring this idea of stewardship and custodianship, treating things as if our lives depended on it, right? This idea of, of conservationalism. And so Alex Fielding and Steve Wozniak, both uh, co-founders of Privateer, they reached out to me and said, look, we fully embrace this vision of yours. And uh, we couldn't think of a better person to uh, you know, take on this role of chief scientific advisor with Privateer. And we want to make space more transparent. What's up there? Who does it belong to? What can it do? Make space more predictable. What, what's going to happen between any couple of objects, not just this 20-minute horizon, but even days, weeks, months? And given any common situation between two countries, how are they going to respond to that? And then the last thing is, can we develop a body of evidence by which people can be aided in what they're trying to do in space and hold them accountable for their behaviors? And so, you know, I, I, I would say kind of jokingly, 
Alex Fielding, Steve Wozniak, and myself were the three amigos tied at the hip in this idea of environmentalism and space and connecting it to land, air, and oceans. Okay. Uh, the next uh, question is not really a question. It's more a comment. It comes from Sonia, who says, our lives do depend on the environment. Thank you, Dr. Ja. Thank you, Sonia. Raymond wants to know, how likely is it that we will experience the Kessler syndrome? Yeah, so Raven, I have to tell you, uh, I'm not a big fan of the whole Kessler syndrome thing. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Don Kessler and his work. At the same time, this Why idea- Why don't you tell us what it is? Yeah, okay, so let me tell you what it is, right? So for that great question. So in, in general terms, it's this idea that uh, there's going to be there's going to come a tipping point in things on orbit such that even if you don't launch anything else things are just going to start colliding with each other in this kind of exponential way where we're just going to have this ring around the planet and we're not going to be able to use space anymore so we're going to have collisions that are kind of go out to infinity this ca this 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 cascading effect and space becomes unusable so I don't really subscribe to that because everything that I've seen about nature shows me that nature, when left to her own devices, she seeks equilibrium. You know, with COVID, we couldn't travel. What's one of the first things that we saw with, with as a consequence of COVID? Oh, wow. People in Venice can like see to the bottom of the canals because we're not churning up stuff with the uh, Vaporetto and all that stuff. Uh, animals were coming out of the forest and coming in uh, closer to our homes and things like that. So nature, nature shows us that she wants to achieve equilibrium. But the key thing is that our movement, our interaction with nature has to be slowly paced sufficiently so that we allow nature to provide us feedback of our unintentional uh, consequences of how we use a given ecosystem. So I think that's the, that's the thing we need to look at is not Kessler syndrome, but actually saturating orbital capacity and behaving in a way which unintentionally leads us to that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, Jay Poliga has an interesting take. Is there any financial incentive to catching debris in space or is this only a quote unquote good citizen problem? There is financial uh, incentive, Jay Polega. What, what we need first is we need sustainability metrics. So I think if we can define orbital carrying capacity, if we can define a space traffic footprint as a carbon footprint analog, composite index that basically uh, measures the burden of any given object on the safety and sustainability of other things, then we have something that can be monetized, right? You can say, hey, th this orbit, its capacity is saturated. If you clean these things, this is how much capacity is given back to the orbit, or this is how much space traffic footprint you can remove. We can put bounties on things. We can have insurance companies charge premiums based on space traffic footprints or how much capacity uh, any given constellation is going to take. In the absence of the sustainability metrics, it's not monetizable. It's just good Samaritan kind of work. Okay. Uh, we have time for one more question. There's so many good ones. I apologize to everyone we could not get to, but we'll share your questions with Dr. Ja afterwards for sure. And this last question comes from Rocklist. Does Space Force help at all? Yes. Yes. So this is where we need uh, all hands on deck, all organizations. Look, I served in the military, uh, even though... Uh, you know, militaries go to war and these sorts of things. The people that I served with were really focused on peace. Um, I served with well-hearted, well-intentioned folks. And I can say that the Space Force is actually, should be looked at as an entity that can do a lot of good in showing leadership in trying to develop norms of behavior in space and helping monitor, like the biggest publicly available catalog aside from the stuff that I have, you know, I, I use their information as part of what we have in Astrograph is, you know, the, the 18th uh, Space Control Squadron, they have spacetrack.org. That's the Space Force putting information out there that's useful to people. So absolutely, I think the Space Force 
has a role to do a lot of good uh, in, in getting us to this you know, place of, of being able to harmonize and, and jointly and holistically utilize uh, space in a way that is long-term sustainable. Okay, excellent. And uh, I'm sorry I lied. There's another question that's here is so, is so good. I'm going to ask one more. Uh, Dara from your school of Molokai asked, Dr. Ja, who are your environmental role models or heroes? I want to say this, Dara. Um, you know, it, I think it would be cliche to say, you know, you know, Greta Thunberg, right? Uh, I, I definitely have enjoyed seeing some of the things that she's done in the near term. But one person that has motivated me a lot, actually, is Jane Goodall. And the work that she did with chimpanzees uh, in Africa and that sort of stuff. And, you know, in looking at her work, interestingly enough, I saw that she did field work and she brought together a bunch of scientists for a meeting. And she said, you know, I went into that meeting a scientist and I came out not only a scientist, but an activist. And that's how I feel. It's like I was sending stuff to Mars I was doing rovers and satellites around Mars and all that other stuff. I moved to Maui and I, I went to Maui, an astrodynamicist and a spacecraft navigator. And I left Maui as those things and the space environmentalist by seeing the connection of land, air uh, and ocean to, to what we're doing in space. So I'd say Jane Goodall is definitely uh, probably my, my top uh, inspiration in terms of, um, you know, environmentalist that's known as a single person, but I think a better way to even answer you is I'm more motivated beyond Jane Goodall. I'm more motivated by indigenous people around the globe that have really embraced this intergenerational contract of stewardship, like the Hawaiians, like the Maori, like the Aborigines, like the Inuit, like the Dine, uh, like the Lakota. So all these indigenous people for eons have figured this out. And, um, you know, People have called them savages and have said all sort of detrimental things to them, uh, but they actually have something to teach us and their voice is strong. Mariba, your story is a powerful one. Thanks so much for joining us here. Thank um, you. Everybody, we want to share a short preview of an exciting project that Dr. Ja is leading. You are seeing the world premiere of this trailer of this video. So let's play that now. We have gazed upon and drawn knowledge from the stars since the beginning of time. But the push for advanced technology has resulted in a growing accumulation of space junk. We are burying the stars with our trash. Every one of those dots is something that a human is responsible for having put in orbit. And most of the stuff is just going to stay there like forever. I'm Mora Baja astrodynamicist and space environmentalist. I invite you to join me as we travel the world to collectively explore solutions to this growing problem of space junk. I became a space environmentalist in the spirit of honoring that land, air, sea, and space are interconnected. This has shifted space. looks like a fantastic project. And everybody in the audience, you can also find out more information about Dr. Jha's work and see more of him through our Hot Science Cool Talks archives. Can I say now something? We, oh, please. So, so the thing that I want to say with Shifted Space is this. I've realized that I can't just do the scientific and technical work. I also have to have this kind of public figure thing and um, reaching out to people all across the globe. And so what Shifted Space is all about is me traveling all over the world, kind of like a Tony Bourdain, but for space, connecting with people, interacting with them, showing humanity that we're more similar than we're different, and trying to recruit that empathy across that humanity to really say, we need to treat this environment like our lives dependent on it. So there you go, there's Shifted Space. Excellent. And we're inviting you now to join Dr. Ja and us for the world premiere of the full video, which is only about five minutes long, but it's really cool. This is the first time it's being shown. Shifted space. In the chat is the link. 
just follow the link and watch the video. We'll be watching it here. Once again, thanks so much, Mariba. And thank you, everybody, for watching Hot Science at Home from the University of Texas at Austin. Have a great night. Aloha.